Hello and welcome everyone uh, for this uh, a global indoor air quality and respiratory infection webinar series. So this is the seventh webinar, which happens to be the last one uh, in the series. Uh, this has been uh, a fascinating in the series of webinars um, from a number of speakers coming across the world. So we started uh, the first one with Professor Lydia Morvaska on 13th of October. And uh, uh, since then, we have been having you know, the colleagues coming from uh, Brazil, from India, from Bangladesh, from Ethiopia, from Nigeria, China, um, and uh, uh, you know, the Tanzania, Egypt, Kurdistan in Iraq, and today um, we have uh, uh, the uh, we have uh, uh, two talks. So it it will be myself talking about some of the, the work which we have been doing as part of uh, you know this initiative, and uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Professor uh, Angus Magnabola uh, from Trinity College Dublin. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, you know bring some uh, housekeeping notes. So first of all. Um, this video will be, uh, this webinar session will be recorded. So you can uh, see it uh, later on, we can share. So we'll, we'll share the chat link, uh, sorry, the link in the chat box. So uh, uh, to, 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 to look at it later on. Uh, the other bit is to, um, uh, if you have any questions and answers, so we will take them towards the end of the session. So please use, use the Q and A box. Um, and we will pick those questions, uh, you know, later on. So uh, with this, uh, uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Alex Lewis to open this webinar and chair the two sessions. So Alex is the Director of Research Strategy at the University of Surrey, and she's responsible for supporting the research priorities of the university and large strategic bids. Uh, having spent six years at SOAS, she is passionate about equitable partnership and supporting international collaboration, which seek to solve the global challenges. So she has been a great supporter you know, of this work. So thank you very much, Alex. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar. So I'm absolutely delighted to have been given the opportunity to open the seventh and final webinar of this webinar series, uh, which has been organized as part of the EPSRC and Surrey supported ODA project, Knowledge Transfer and Practical Application of Research on Indoor Air Quality, also known as KTP IAQ. And projects such as these are exactly the type of research that the university wants to promote. It is interdisciplinary, it is international, and seeks to address global challenges such as good health and well-being and sustainable cities and communities and helps us to continue to be recognized for our work having been ranked 61st worldwide in the the impact awards last year so sustainability at surrey is at the very heart of what we of what we do and we're excited to be launching an institute for sustainability later on this year and in fact currently seeking to recruit the founding director for that institute so do have a look, I think it closes on the 4th of April, if anybody is interested. Um, but this webinar series has brought together speakers from a number of our collaborative institutions from across the world, including partners from the Global Challenges Research Fund supported projects, Care Homes and Care Cities, uh, projects that have been successful in monitoring household air pollution in several low income countries, uh, sorry, low income homes in 12 cities across 12 ODA countries, which at under normal circumstances is no mean feat and particularly to manage that type of project through a global pandemic is, is you know amazing um so this series though will serve as a knowledge exchange platform across the oda countries with the aim to share and discuss state-of-the-art best practice on indoor air quality and respiratory infection globally the series uh, will exploit this knowledge by presenting the the sort of the science taken during the global pandemic where indoor environments have become even more important than ever um, and such knowledge exchange will surely make a positive impact on the health and well-being of people. So Professor Kumar and his team have lined up a number of keynote speakers who specialise in the air quality and health field from across the world to present in this series of webinars. And today we are privileged to hear from two leading researchers in environmental and civil engineering, Professor Prashant Kumar and Professor Angus Magnabola. And I'm sure Professor Kumar needs no introduction to this group, but I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce him. So Professor Prashant Kumar is the founding director of the Global Centre for Clean Air Research and the Associate Dean International for the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences at the University of Surrey. His multidisciplinary research builds an understanding of air pollution sources and their contributions to indoor and outdoor air quality and mitigation strategies to reduce air pollution exposure. 
He led the GCRF Clean Air Engineering Franchise Projects, Care Cities and Care Homes, and KTP IAQ, around which his talk is focused today. So uh, without further ado, I shall pass you over to um, Professor Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. <clears throat> yeah, so um, what I'm going to do is today, I will talk about some of the work we have been doing over the last 12 months um, as a, uh, in collaboration with our, our partners. Um, this work is you know, focused around the in-kitchen exposure. So, <clears throat> so to start with, I would like to thank actually, uh, you know, the, the whole team um, of researchers, uh, which comes from 12 ODA countries, but also uh, the colleagues uh, from uh, Trinity College Dublin. So you will hear, uh, you know, from Professor Angus Maknabola um, and uh, uh, Professor Lydia Morawaska, Matthias Kertjel. So, and, and so these colleagues have, uh, you know, been supporting, uh, you know, these, uh, this initiative. So um, we had uh, almost around 40 researchers involved, you know, in this collaboration, uh, you know, since the beginning. So, um, <clears throat> so if I just uh, uh, like to acknowledge uh, the, the PIs of, uh, you know, the different cities who have been leading their team. So you can see a, a list actually that comes from uh, Southeast University, University of Dhaka, um, you know, the IIT Madras and IIT Delhi, and uh, going into the Latin America with the University of Sao Paulo and uh, University um, uh, of National, uh, you know, de Colombia, uh, and the further going into, uh, you know, the Middle East. Um, and uh, in Africa, we had a, uh, a number of collaborators and the, uh, you know, the cities and, uh, you know, which has been kind of represented uh, in, this, uh, in this collaboration. So, um, so, you know, if I just put actually these on the maps, so you can see how the spread looks like. So these are the cities uh, which we were focusing in Latin America, which includes uh, uh, in the Medellin and uh, uh, Sao Paulo. And then we had, uh, you know, the, the two in, uh, in the Middle East uh, uh, region, which is uh, Egypt and, uh, uh, you know, in Iraq. Then we had uh, the four of them, in the Southeast Asia, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, which is including uh, India, you know, the, uh, the China and, uh, you know, the Bangladesh. And uh, then a, a number of cities actually, uh, you know, from Africa. So, um, <clears throat> so just to give a little bit of history. So this is a, a kind of a, a franchise of clean air engineering, which we call it CARE. Uh, so the first project was the Care City, so that uh, run for uh, almost around 15 months uh, uh, that focused around the car exposure. The second one, then we had the follow-up one, which called it Care Homes, uh, where uh, you know we focused around the indoor uh, in-kitchen kind of environments in low-income uh, homes, and then the the KTP IAQ, this webinar series that allowed us to exploit the results, but also uh, bring the best practices in you know, other together. So the idea was to uh, to achieve our goals collaboratively. So these studies were designed in such a way that uh, um, uh, you know that uh, the the people can do uh, the work by themselves. So some of the cities even didn't have actually you know this kind of work done before uh, in their individual groups. Where you know so we we developed this approach in a DIY kind of manner and uh, uh, you know collaboratively designing you know these uh, uh, these studies. So the, the idea has been uh, to develop this uh, international networking platform, which has been going very strong um, and expanding uh, you know, with time. And we are still uh, you know, we are keen actually to expanding it even further in future. Um, carry out the pilot studies, as you will see um, you know, the, some of the work I will present today. And the more importantly, building the capacity of um, you know, why the researcher exchange, why are co-designing the studies and the knowledge sharing. So, um, so basically, um, what uh, you know, we we started with was there were a number of these uh, uh, workshops we did. So in the beginning, we had the workshop in in Surrey, where you know all our partners were there, and they were I think very good days when you know we can see each other uh, you know face to face. You can see some of the snapshots here. We had uh, the workshops in Cairo, um, and uh, that was uh, another kind of a very fascinating kind of experience. Uh, to hold these workshops and uh, you know meet the local stakeholders and listen actually to the uh, you know the challenges uh, you know the people face at the at the at the, at the ground level, and uh, 
so uh, and then uh, what we also did is in in parallel so we have uh, uh, you know released this guidance document uh, on the schools and uh, so our collaborators have been working uh, you know uh, in their respective countries so they they produced actually the guidance for uh, you know in their local language so to date we had around 20 uh, you know uh, languages um, it has been released in over 16 countries and that's still keep going so we have another four or five actually which are coming up you know the very soon so it's been a um, uh, you know the the fascinating kind of uh, initiative that allowed us to uh, you know to work on different fronts now just to say a little bit about the clean air engineering for cities so as i mentioned the focus was more on the in car particulate matter exposure across the across the cities and then um, this was the, the 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 study which produced actually a comparable data set across all these uh, you know uh, all these cities so first of the work we did was uh, looking into the exploratory analysis of the data, understanding the contrasting features in different cities and what were the things which were, you know, uh, which were common and what were the bits actually which were more um, required, more bespoke kind of, uh, you know, the, the impact. And then what we did is we extended this work uh, to uh, extrapolate to the city scale by doing some of the modeling studies and understanding actually what are the potential health risks. And these were published, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, earlier. And there was one very interesting, uh, you know, the finding from this work was that uh, if you look at the the exposure of the PM 2.5, which is the particulate matter less than 2.5 micron in diameter, and you see actually what is the city specific GDP on the x axis here. So, so the higher the GDP, um, sorry, the lower the GDP, the higher is the kind of exposure. So that basically clearly explains uh, on a uh, you know with this evidence that. The, the the inequality, the social inequality is received. So if you are poorer, then you are also being penalized actually, uh, you know, having um, the higher exposure. Obviously there were some outliers. So this is a, a Gonju uh, in China. Uh, so you can see this, uh, you know, this black, uh, the, the brown spot there, which has got the high, um, you know, the GDP, but pollution level is also high, but this also uh, kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, highlights actually that uh, possibly the change of um, the pace or the economical pace is, uh, is not really being keeping up with the, uh, the upkeep of the environment. So, um, so today I'm gonna talk more about the care home. So this is a, a study which uh, is just hot of the praise that came last week. So thanks to all the collaborators, you can see here, um, all of them listed, uh, you know, working really hard during the pandemic times when we were all struggling. So the, the, the number of uh, researchers at the MSc and the PhD level, they've been working hard actually to go to these, uh, you know, to the sites, collecting this data and then helping managing and analyzing and writing it up. So it's been a, in a fantastic, uh, you know, the, the, the collaborative effort in that. So what we did in this work was, um, I mean, there were some challenges. The challenges in terms of, if let's say you are running a study in different cities, you might end up using very different instrument and they will give you a very different answer to the same problem. So the data will not be comparable. So one of the things we did is we developed a unified methodology so that each city could use the same set of equipment, which are quality controlled. So we have a common quality control procedure. Then um, we try to you know, um, fix actually that look, we wanted to have the height at the breathing height in each of the, each of the places. We should have the the distance, which is very fixed to the cooking, uh, you know, the cooking, um, uh, cooking, uh, you know, the appliances, and uh, uh, so we picked up like five low income homes in each city, and then we had uh, uh, one week monitoring continuously so that we can we can track actually the uh, the diurnal variation, but also look the, the what is the week, the weekly kind of uh, you know the variations and measuring the aerosols, which is PM two point five, PM ten. The CO2, so we can understand the ventilation conditions and the thermal comfort in terms of the RH and temperature. Um, and at the same time, we also had the uh, the building and occupant survey, so we understand actually what is the size, length, height, width, and uh, uh, how close they are from the different sources and so on. And we then uh, we we designed this bespoke setup actually, so it's basically that you just take it and just stick it to the wall and plug it and it will start uh, logging the data. So as you can see here, and also considering the safety issues in terms of, uh, you know, whether, um, uh, so designing a kind of a, you know, the flexible case that can also be, um, uh, you know, the transported uh, through the carrier, courier. <clears throat> so um, so what we did is then uh, we had this data, uh, you know, the collected over a period of six months. 
Uh, and then we divided this data into different uh, classification, different ventilation conditions, uh, uh, in terms of the cooking for fuel, uh, what kind of cooking, you know, the, because the cultural differences are laid to a different type of cooking in there and the region. So what we did is that in terms of the ventilation, we had uh, the three types uh, usually when we uh, looked into it. So the natural, which is uh, a kitchen with the, having a door open or a kitchen with having a door plus windows open. And then the, the, there were kitchens actually, they have the natural ventilation plus uh, the extractor fans, uh, you know, in some of them. Yeah, so they were like a three kind of a, you know, the wide, uh, you know, the category. So you're seeing it quite a lot in there. Uh, but this is uh, the classification we did on the data to kind of, uh, you know, to identify what's happening in, in different uh, uh, different kitchens. So as you can see here, um, these, uh, uh, the, these ventilation conditions were very different uh, in different kitchens. So to understand or to compare like by like, so we looked into, you know, these, uh, these ventilation categories. So these are, this is the kind of, uh, you know, the things you are seeing there. So you, if you notice here that this kitchen has got a, you know, the teen on top of it rather than having you know, the, the proper kind of ceiling. Some of them has got uh, um, the, the windows and uh, uh, the doors, but some of them has only got the windows. So um, so these surveys were capturing actually as much as we can, but it was a pandemic time, so you can't be inside in there. So there were protocols to be followed in terms of uh, how do we, uh, you know, how do we measure it and uh, minimize uh, the contact actually with the with the with the occupant. So basically they were the ones actually who were doing most of the work by, uh, you know, on the instructions there. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about, I think three or four key findings and obviously you have access to the paper so you can talk about that uh, in the interest of time. So the one thing was the ventilation. So I think the one take home message from this study was that if you have a better ventilation, it means you reduce your exposure uh, quite significantly. So the kitchens which has having uh, the, the mechanical ventilation so that basically has got uh, the natural plus the extracted fence in there. They sort the lowest concentrations uh, compared with the, um, uh, you know, the other, uh, the natural category. So within the natural category, if you only got the doors, so they were showing you the highest concentrations and the one which has got the windows there as well. So this basically is the lower. So if you look into the hierarchical sense, so you have the natural plus mechanical giving the best results followed by the, um, uh, you know, the natural with the door and windows and the door. So the idea there is basically that, uh, you know, to improve the ventilation conditions will simply reduce the exposure of the occupants in that region. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's an interesting finding. We know that the ventilation helps, but this is an evidence basically that basically emphasizes on the fact that, you know, we should be looking into making these kind of changes, you know, uh, if possible in this, uh, uh, in this kitchen environment. The another, um, the key kind of, you know, the message from this work was the fuel type. So the people were using LPG, natural gas, and the charcoal, uh, you know, for the cooking. So as you can understand, the, we know that the charcoal is really, uh, you know, um, will, will be very filthy in terms of uh, the emissions. And that was clearly, uh, you know, evident from the results here as well, that showing uh, almost around nine times higher, uh, you know, the doses of the, the pollution compared with the, uh, with the LPG. And if you look into the exposure, you know, the, um, uh, the perspective, then you can see, uh, you know, that has got a, quite a high uh, level of, uh, uh, you know, the concentration exposure compared with the natural gas and LPG. So the message here basically was again, that, uh, you know, more we uh, work on this cooking fuel, it means that we can eliminate the source itself. Now, the third, um, you know, the very important, um, you know, the aspect of this was the volume of the kitchen. So what we did is we divided the, all the kitchens into three volume categories, which is four to 15 meter cube, then 16 to 45, and then 46 to 120. And uh, what, we, what we see is that smaller the volume of the kitchen, higher were the concentration. And that kind of, uh, um, you know, um, was very clear for the small uh, kitchen, but uh, it was much more kind of, uh, um, you know, the, um, the, the mixed trend actually between the, the two bigger volumes. And there was a good reason for, uh, you know, this. So for example, smaller volumes means you got a lower space for these emissions to dilute and uh, more opportunity for accumulations. That that's what you see actually the higher kind of, you know, the concentrations. 
uh, but in the the in the 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 volume of the kitchen increases, that means that your concentration will go down, which is the trend here. The reason why you are seeing actually a little bit of uh, differentiation here because some of the kitchens, which is having the higher volume, they were not really the kitchen itself. They were basically the whole house of the low income household. So they were like cooking in the same place where they are also living and doing other activities. So. And the um, the one of the, the last kind of points to make there was the uh, you know the cultural differences because we cook and eat very differently. So what we did was we divided actually those activities what they were doing into different cooking type, looking at the frying, reheating, boiling, steaming, and uh, roasting and grilling. So try to gather as much information as we could get actually from the uh, the occupants, and then try to categorize it on an individual homes basis. And that allowed us to understand um, that what activities are giving us the highest kind of uh, in the emissions. So for example, a frying and uh, uh, the boiling and steaming, if you look at uh, you know, the red and green on this uh, figure is kind of dominating. So they were basically the, the, the highest emitting activity. So what it tells is that if there is a awareness among people that look, if you are doing these activities which are going for a very long time, then you could avoid actually the passive occupancy at the first place so that the other people are not there in there. In there. Secondly, also in sometimes when people are doing those activities, they are not really bothering too much about what's coming out, rather they are focused about the food itself. So bring a little bit more awareness about uh, uh, you know may, how you can reduce the exposure during uh, you know during the cooking uh, that might be uh, you know the another kind of uh, you know the step forward so what we are doing now is uh, uh, we had a another set of data which is looking at the co2 and thermal comfort so we have been working on this uh, paper which is currently under review where we had uh, uh, you know uh, done the similar sort of analysis but this time we are looking into the air change rate in the kitchens what is the thermal comfort conditions what is the, um, the the ventilation and the CO2 exposure, plus uh, linking it with the uh, you know with the with the bigger picture. So so this is basically about the um, uh, you know about this work. So if I say some of the take home kind of messages from there, uh, the the one thing which was very clear was increased ventilation. Either it's a dual ventilation, use of uh, you know the extractor fans, or it could also be that. Uh, 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 you know, there are um, the cooking hoods actually that could allow, uh, you know, um, absorbing some of those emissions in there. Uh, the use of cook, uh, you know, cleaner fuels and uh, electric cookers, uh, uh, you know, that's basically something which is a, a in the large programs going on in these countries. And I think there is a, a big need and this, this project or this data makes a very strong point, uh, you know, to support actually this kind of, uh, you know, the global initiatives. The another one is the frying, actually, although we don't want to change our, you know, the, the eating habits or the frying habits, but there are a number of things, actually, which we could do. And this is one activity which uh, was, uh, you know, really coming out uh, very clearly um, being the most polluted. Then we had this kitchen volume. So I think um, the one of the ideas there is that, uh, you know, when people are uh, either having a new build, whether they can increase the kitchen volume by either having a larger surface area or increasing the height of uh, you know those kitchens, uh, and you could also maintain actually the the volume as is as long as you can maintain the ventilation. So there is a kind of a trade off between the ventilation kitchen volume. So if you are not doing anything with the ventilation, then the larger kitchen will give you the benefit of what you will not get actually um, otherwise having uh, you know the the natural ventilation. Uh, the minimize the positive occupancy, especially children, because in households, you know, when um, the, 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 the parents are cooking, the children are more likely to, you know, accompany them. So what you are doing is you're having a the passive occupancy there. And obviously, uh, you know, if you wanted to go a little further and, and, and use the technology, then installing those CO2 monitors to alert the occupants in those kitchens uh, could really help as well, because if, if they see that, you know, the, this gone red, it means that they need some sort of action in terms of, uh, you know, uh, ventilate them. So all these action points has been a very clearly kind of, um, you know, the mentioned in this paper, you might want you to have a look at. Uh, but what we are doing at the moment is uh, we're trying to combine all these key findings in a very simple messages through a guidance document, sim something similar we did for the school guidance, uh, you know, the going, uh, you know, the going forward. Um, I think that's it basically from my side, uh, just to finish again. So just to thank, uh, you know, the whole team in particular number of researchers from the GCARE, uh, you know, like Sakao, Thama, Rana, Veronica, Thiago, um, you know, um, uh, Huevan, 
and uh, uh, our all the partners and their team actually who has really uh, been uh, you know fantastic with this initiative and we wish that uh, we could secure a little more funding beyond march and we can continue uh, with this network and we'll keep doing actually this great work so thank you very much uh, um, i'm not sure alex how did I do with time? But yeah, uh, perfect. You were spot on 20 minutes, I think. So brilliant. Thank you very much. I didn't have to interrupt you at all. So and thank you very much for a fascinating talk with uh, some, you know, some real uh, excellent sort of recommendations, um, you know, and applicable recommendations out of the research as well. So thank you very much for that. We'll keep questions and answers till the end, though. Uh, so I think um, and just to remind everybody as well, if they do have any questions, please do add them to the question and answers box um, and we'll address them after Professor Angus McNabola, um, who uh, is a professor in the en Energy and the Environment at the Department of Civil Structural and Engin Environmental Engineering at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. He is also a visiting professor at the GKS Centre in Surrey and is a long term collaborator in air quality research with Professor Kumar. Uh, Professor Magna Bola has worked in the air pollution research arena for over 15 years, primarily in air pollution topics relating to the transport environment, passive air pollution control systems in cities, building ventilation and green infrastructure. Um, and his primary expertise, though, lies in the study of the fluid dynamics of environmental and energy and engineering challenges. And we're delighted to have him here to present to us today. So um, over to you, Angus. Thank you, Alex, for that very kind introduction. Um, and uh, thanks, Prashant. For, for inviting me here today. Um, I, I, I want to start off with, with first of all, thanking Prashant and the whole Surrey and G-Care team for this um, whole series, which I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, I think it's been a great initiative and it's, uh, as we were discussing earlier this morning, it's sad that it's coming to an end. So, so I, I want to express my thanks for that. But um, so my talk is, is uh, a, a little different from, from, from um, what Prashant just discussed earlier on in, in that uh, I'm dealing with, uh, you can see in the title here, passive indoor air pollution control and ventilation systems. And so Prashant presented this morning the, the quantification of the problem of air quality indoors. And here I'm, I'm presenting some, some work that we've been doing together, uh, looking at ways that we could passively control indoor air pollution. And, and you can see in the title, ventilation is key and ventilation was a key um, element in, in the, the talk that Prashant just gave. So by, by passive indoor air pollution control, what I'm referring to here is trying to reduce concentrations indoors, but doing so without um, inducing additional energy consumption, right? So we know that there are lots of ways of, of, of reducing concentrations, but often they, they consume energy themselves, so they're not necessarily sustainable. So that's, that's the kind of focus. And so this project um, has been going on for a few years. Um, it's mostly been carried out by a PhD student here in, in Trinity in Dublin, um, Brian Considine, but it's also then supervised by myself um, and John Gallagher here in Dublin and, and Prashant. And so it's a joint project between Surrey and Trinity and is funded by the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. So, um, the control of air pollution indoors, we've already heard, you know, ventilation is a, is a great way of, of, of um, achieving a certain amount of air change rates, and that is often coupled with, with filtration of, of, indoor, of indoor air and incoming outdoor air, and maybe those things are also, also housed in a HVAC system, a heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. Um, and those are particularly common for commercial buildings, public buildings, and so on. Um, and obviously less so in the domestic sector. But those HVAC systems, while they can achieve a good level of air pollution control indoors, uh, they consume a lot of energy. So our focus here is to try and tackle that sustainability issue. So you know, HVAC systems on the building level can consume between 20 and 70% of the building's total energy. Um, and that, that variation is down to the, the amount of ventilation, the amount of, of heating and cooling required. And um, you know, maybe on, a, on a larger scale, uh, HVAC systems, for example, consume 11% of electricity in Europe. So they, they really are a, a large source of energy consumption. And uh, one, of that, one of the parts of that energy consumption is to do with the ventilation fan. So obviously, if we're, we're trying to achieve a certain ventilation of spaces, then our fan has to consume an amount of electricity to achieve that movement of air. And in addition to that, we all often add filters to try and filter um, out, uh, incoming particles and also particles that are, are emitted indoors. And those produce a pressure drop. So if you, you can imagine putting a, a filter in front of your mouth, it's harder to breathe through it. So there's an extra work for the fan to do um, in filtration. And that pressure drop also then increases over time. So once the, the filter starts to become clogged with, with particles, 
that energy consumption starts well generally starts to go up if the fan is a variable speed fan so there, there are generally two types of fans ones are, are more modern buildings have a variable speed fan that keeps a, a set um, air change rate and so as the filters become blocked the fan has to spin faster and work harder to more energy and then in 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 older buildings, we have fixed speed fans, and, and then as the filters become blocked in those settings, uh, well, then the ventilation just drops, and so we have poorer indoor air quality. So the aims of this project then was to try and develop um, some technology that acts as a pre-filter to the an air handling unit, which is AHU there, an air handling unit. And the picture there is a typical image of what one of those uh, things looks like. So the, the air handling unit, um, the inlet of it here is is something that we're trying to redesign so we're trying to redesign the inlet of an air handling unit to act as a pre-filter um without actually containing a filter itself using the concept called aspiration efficiency now i'm sure probably nobody in the audience have heard of aspiration efficiency or very few but essentially what we're trying to do is is engineer particle physics and take advantage of the inertia of particles to try and avoid them from entering the ventilation in the first place and uh, we'll get on to in a second how that is done and what aspiration exactly is so the goals of the project are twofold improving indoor air quality and reducing energy consumption so then what is it what is aspiration efficiency this this is a, a basically a measurement index of um the ratio between the ambient concentration and the concentration that enters an orifice and it was originally a lot of research uh, went on in this area in the development of sampling devices so if you look at the image here on the bottom um if you imagine that let's say we, we use a sampling device to draw air into it to, to measure the concentration of particles we would expect that the concentration outside c0 is the same as concentration c that's drawn in but in fact it's actually quite difficult for that to, to be the same all the time because there are a number of factors at play as to determine whether the particle enters the, the sampler or not. So unlike gases, the particles have a mass and inertia, and they are driven by the, the ambient wind. And then there's also a balance here of how much we are, uh, the force we're implying on those um, through the suction of the, uh, the, the ventilation rate of the, of the sampler. So all of those factors together play together to mean that in, in certain scenarios, our, our aspiration seat efficiency can be considerably less than one. So we end up with a lower concentration being sampled than what is outside. And we can also end up with a higher concentration, which sort of immediately doesn't make sense as to how could we have more concentration than the ambient. And it's not that there is more particles, it's just more concentrated. So the, the main factors that affect us is, is the sampling or ventilation rate, the angle at which the, the sampler is to the ambient wind. So for example, generally, if, it's, if the, the inlet is pointing away from the wind it's it's harder for particles to make their way via a 180 degree turn into the inlet than it is if it's directly on it and so there are a number of particles and so what we tried to do was to re-engineer or to take that concept and apply it to a ventilation system which is if you think about a ventilation system and an air sampling device they are very similar only on a much larger scale both have an inlet and filters and so on so uh, just just by means of of um some context here there is this is some very old research on aspiration efficiency for sampling devices and also for this mannequin here which had a, a little inlet in the in the mouth and nose um, and it just goes to illustrate um that depending on the various factors of particle size uh wind speed orientation of the of the inlet we can have a variety of uh, concentrations being drawn in versus what is outside. So that the two graphs underneath here um, illustrate where uh, the difference between the two. So the one on the left graph A is, is for the mannequin above where the particles um, and the mannequin is facing directly into the stream of particles. And the one on, on the right B is, is where the mannequin's head is turned the opposite direction. And so what you can notice in, in for some of the scenarios, we have an aspiration or sampling efficiency as written there of two, which means that the concentration was double the ambient concentration. And, and, and it, it, where in graph B, we have concentrations as low as 10% or aspiration efficiencies as low as 10%. So what we thought, well, if we could manage to engineer an inlet that would achieve these very low um, sampling efficiencies, then you know that could be act as a, as a kind of a passive pre-filter. That's what we set out to achieve. So how did we get on with that? what comes next so the project involved a number of things and it's still going on so we're not quite finished but we had the review of 
of aspiration efficiency literature, developed a sort of numerical method to try and model this. Then we started out to assess existing HVAC systems and their inlets. So that generally their inlets are called in the industry rain hoods as they're designed to keep rain droplets from entering the system and making the filters wet. Um, and after we had done that, we would go on to um, try and develop inlets ourselves, which would, would prevent to have a lower aspiration efficiency and prevent particles from entering. And then the last part, which is ongoing now, is real world demonstration of all this. And so what I'm going to focus on today is, is essentially the, the, the two middle bullet points here, the aspiration efficiency of existing systems and then of our, our new designs. So the first part, this is numerical investigation of the ingress of particulate pollution from the ambient environment into the building of via an, an air handling unit. And that was published last year in um, Indoor Air. And so the full, full details of what I'm going to say are, are available there if you, if you want to look into it further. But I'll summarize the main findings briefly. So what we did was we tested two commercial rain hoods. And these are the inlets of air handling units. One was a sort of a louver design. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. And, and then one more of a generic type. We tested those from a variety of ambient wind speeds from one and a half to 10 meters per second and a variety of flow rates of the, of the ventilation system. So 3,800, for example, is quite a kind of standard flow rate and 1,200 is a bit lower. Um, we, we tested a variety of particle sizes and then we also tested the system facing forward into the wind and also uh, the acronym there, RF rear facing, facing opposite to the wind. Now, the domain of the, this, so this was done via simulation. The domain of the simulation looked a little as is shown there, where we had our air handling unit in the center. Um, what we were doing was releasing particles of a variety of concentrations from the velocity inlet there in the background, and then measuring what ends up inside the air handling unit in the center. And the two inlets are shown underneath. Inlet one is the generic one, and then the louvered one. You can see um, on, the, on the right is quite a common inlet design for an air handling unit. And we compared the performance of both of those. Um, the, the way the domain is drawn there, this is where the air handling unit is, is um, the inlet is opposite to the wind direction. We also did the, the opposite scenario where, where this air handling unit is, is rotated by 180 degrees. So um, I won't dwell particularly too, too much on this, but needless to say, when we're doing a CFD modeling exercise, a fluid dynamics modeling exercise, it's very important to ensure that our model matches very well the physical reality. So our, our measurements were very carefully and robustly compared against wind tunnel measurements. So again, in, you can go into the paper to see the full results of that. So the results then of, of, of this exercise, what, what were the main findings? So if I draw your attention to the graph really on, on the, the bottom right there, you can see there's a, a series of six trend lines and we have on one axis is the, is the aspiration efficiency. So this is the ratio of the ambient concentration versus what went in. And if it was 100%, then they are the same. Less than 100%, well then less concentration has gone into the air handling unit. And on the bottom is ambient wind speed. And what you can notice then is there are two kind of groupings of, of those six trend lines. The, the, the three at the top, which are kind of more or less close to 100%, the average is a little bit less. And those are all for when the air handling unit was facing into the wind. You can see on, on average there, about 95 to 100%, um, aspiration efficiency. So there was very little difference between the concentrations in the ambient environment and what ended up. But when the, when the air handling unit was facing the opposite direction, so the particles have to go all the way around it and turn into the inlet, you could see the average aspiration efficiency for the average wind speed in Dublin is about three and a half meters per second, it was about 50%. So if you think about that, then about 50% of the concentration didn't enter the air handling unit just by the fact that it was opposite to the ambient um, wind direction, which makes a significant difference to the amount of particles going into the building, uh, loading the filter and, and what energy consumption happens over the filter's life. So we were very encouraged by that finding. It, it shows the very similar trends to what was found also for, for sampling devices, which are obviously on a much smaller scale. The, the ventilation rates are much smaller, but it's the same, same kind of trends. So the systems, and the phenomenon of aspiration efficiency obviously scales at this much larger scale. So um, moving on from that, we then tried to develop our own system of uh, inlets, which would try and ensure that we would have lower aspiration efficiencies for more of the time. 
Um, and that study was again published this year in uh, Building an Environment. And again, the, the, the full details are, are, are available there if you want to, to look into it more details. So in general, what we did was tested these four inlet designs uh, underneath their cases one to four. And so th each of those are attached to the inlet of a, an air handling unit. Now, if you look at, look at all four of them, they, they all have a common series of um, kind of circular ports to them. The reason for that is these are sort of an evolution from an earlier study of this idea, which uh, the acronym there, AER, is Aspiration Efficiency Reducer, um, also had that same future, and we were trying to uh, build on, on, on the work of Morgan et al. So the, the concept was behind the four, the first one um, was essentially a smaller version of what Morgan had come up with because uh, their design, although it worked well, um, was a little bit too bulky. And we didn't expect case number one to really uh, to be much better than the, the rain hoods, which it turns out that it would be only marginally better. In the case of case number two, um, you can see that the, the, the inlets are pointing towards the ground more or less. So the inlets are pointing towards the ground. And, and the, the thinking behind this was, regardless of what the wind direction is, the particles will at least have to turn through 90 degrees to get into that inlet. And that uh, element of inertia there would, would, would guarantee a lower, on average, aspiration efficiency. Case number three was then um, very similar to case number one in that when, we, when the wind is blowing from behind case number three, well, we would expect it to have the same kind of uh, findings where we would have an aspiration efficiency of about 50 percent but when it when the wind was facing the, the air handling unit which is not something we could easily rotate um then this sort of baffle plate we were trying to uh, see if well if the particles have to go around it perhaps that would lower the aspiration efficiency the last case well then was kind of a um uh, a combination of the previous ones where where we have an array on three sides of, of a of a kind of a a box. And the, the way we modeled this was that we were able to close any one of the, the three sides, A, B, or C there, depending on what the wind direction was. So for example, if the wind direction was coming facing array C here, we would be able to close that. We were imagining using a damper system. And as a result, then the particles would have to travel over the box to get into the other, other sides. So uh, again, what were the, the, the conditions for all of that? We tested it over a variety of wind speeds. In this case, we stuck to just the standard ventilation rate, the ISO 3400. Again, we did it for a variety of particles and for the forward and rear facing orientations. So what were the findings of all of that? For the first case, um, there was, as I mentioned, there wasn't an enormous difference between this and the louver design, slightly better performance, but again, the same general trends in that uh, the yellow and green lines here, for example, for uh, an ambient wind speed of two and a half, you can see that the aspiration of fishing is starting closer to 90%. It was a little bit more like 95 earlier on. And the same general trend when the wind is uh, coming from behind the air handling unit, where we have a much lower concentration entering. Um, in case, and that, that then increases uh, as, the, as the ambient wind speed goes up, those differences uh, become exaggerated. Case numbers two and three then again, started to marginally improve the performance. And there's a lot of information on the graph here and I'm conscious of the time, but just take, for example, case number two, the, the light blue, for example, here in, in 2.5 meters per second um, facing the wind, it's now starting off at around 80% aspiration efficiency. So even though the wind is blowing at case number two directly, it's now 20% of the particles in the ambient environment that concentration is reduced by. So again, the, the, the findings of that were, were positive. Um, and then the last case was the one that performed the best. This was the, the series of um, motorized arrays. Um, again, we can see here, comparing to previously, where we're now starting off below 80%, uh, around 75 there for, for case number four. And again, it, it retains the same positive um, aspects when the wind is opposite to it and so on. So, Taking all of that information together, um, presented here in this table, these are the average values across the different concentrations and wind speeds for the forward and rear facing inlets in the variety of cases. And so on, on average, what you can notice here is that you know, only one of the cases did we have an aspiration efficiencies of 100% of or slightly greater. That's this for case number one at seven and a half meters per second down at the bottom. But for most of them, there was a reduction in the concentration coming in and some of them, it was very substantial. Now, 
that was very encouraging. Um, uh, at where we are at present is trying to take those designs and then physically test them on the roof of the building of, above my head here. And um, what's presented in this table here is um, essentially a prediction of what those energy savings might be. And the reason it's a prediction is because what the, the savings will depend on what the concentration is here on Dublin, the sort of ambient wind direction and wind speeds obviously varies and that has a big factor. So we don't fully know what it will be, but we expect it to be between three and 9% energy saving. Um, the, the lab tests, like I'm saying the results of them will, will be available maybe after the summer, we're in the beginning starting testing case number one, you can see there in the photo, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, thanks for your attention. Lovely, thank you very much, Angus, for a fascinating talk and uh, really interesting to see how the, the motorised array has that impact on the aspirational efficiency. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and thanks again to um, uh, Prashant for his talk earlier as well. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand back over to Prashant to manage the questions and answer session. But uh, just again, I'd like the opportunity to thank you both uh, for your presentations today and also um, Prashant for a fascinating webinar series over the last sort of few months as well. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alex. If you have any questions, can you please put uh, use the Q and A box, and uh, um, and and we can we can pick it up from there. So so far, I can see a question which is coming uh, for me, and that's talking about in your conclusion, you recommend CO two monitor alert in the kitchen. Considering the cost, do you think low income earners can afford it? If no, what other device can provide for these sets of people? And that comes from Francis Olawale uh, from Nigeria. So Francis, it's a very good question because the priorities of the people who are looking into the low income homes, I guess they are, uh, are towards, I know, other things. And these things might not come actually in top of, you know, their kind of, uh, you know, the, the preferences, uh, but, Considering the long-term kind of you know, the impact one could have on their health and the benefits actually they could have uh, are kind of invisible to them. So the first thing is to, to make some kind of awareness whether the people are, uh, you know, they know that what will be the benefit of doing it. The second question is, um, and then basically, uh, you know, uh, working on the, uh, the acceptability or, uh, you know, the kind of, um, the uptake of this kind of, uh, you know, the majors if they are to be put in place. Now, the second question is very relevant in terms of the affordability because uh, um, they might not want to, you know, make an investment in that. However, the cost of these devices these days has gone down quite significantly. So I'm not sure whether there are any uh, suppliers or the manufacturers or the companies in the um, in this webinar today, uh, but they could give you the, uh, you know, some idea about the, the cost itself. But the question, uh, the, the costs are quite uh, are quite low actually. So for example, if you buy a CO2 monitor, which is just displaying the data, uh, it might be um, the, the, the few pounds possibly, like 20, 30 pounds. But obviously if you convert that into the local kind of, uh, you know, the, um, the currency, it could become, you know, big. So this is an opportunity here also to, um, you know, for these NGOs, which is the non-governmental organizations or the government subsidies, you know, if they, they promote it as part of, you know, their ongoing programs, then that might basically help actually in both sides. So firstly, it reduces the cost for the, um, you know, for the, for the users. The secondly, um, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the uptake of these kind of, uh, uh, you know, the majors in the low income households. So unfortunately, I don't have the very exact answer to this question, but this, these were my thoughts unless uh, unless you wanted to add anything to it. Yeah, I, 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 I can add something to that, uh, Prashant. I was, you know, thinking about the question, probably, you know, the, uh, the most um, impactful thing you can, you can do in that kind of scenario is not necessarily about measuring what the CO2 is in your room, but, but telling people, educating people about the fact that the activity of cooking is, is, is a significant health risk. Um, that might have a more of an impact than than a CO2 monitor, considering the cost of it. And, you know, if the monitor goes off, well, then what are you going to do yeah. about it? Yeah, thank you. So um, I got another question coming from Professor Maria D. Fatima Andrade. Uh, thank you for the presentations, Professor Prasan. The use of face masks during cooking 
could be cheaper and useful for preventing the exposition. Uh, yes, um, I think it's a it's a very good point you made. So anything we do, uh, you know, at the receptor level uh, to reduce the intake of those uh, harmful, uh, you know, the the aerosols or the gases which is coming from the cooking fumes, are uh, are good. Um, the the possibly the challenge is whether people would like to wear the mask actually in their homes when they're they're, they're cooking. So I think it's more uh, of a a kind of breaking a barrier in the behavioral kind of, uh, you know, the, the habits, but definitely it's a good idea. Uh, do you want to say something? On yeah, that, well, on I this? think that, that that's also an interesting idea. Obviously, if you're, if you're cooking and wearing a face mask, well, you're not going to be wearing it while you're eating. And, and uh, like in your, your presentation, Prasant, you, you touched on the, the volume of the room and the ventilation. And you know, when you have a high emission event, that, that pollution stay and there's low ventilation and a low volume, that stays there for quite a long time like the recession curve of that pollution. So you'd have to be wearing the mask for quite a while for it really to be, you know, yeah. effective. So um, I think the ventilation is key there really. Yeah, so in principle, uh, yes, um, I guess, uh, you know, the using the face mask will help, but the, I, as I said, the challenge would be the changing the habits or, you know, so the, the awareness is, is key actually. So if people understand uh, you know what could be the uh, the implications uh, of uh, you know the exposure, then they would be more receptive to the ideas like in improving the ventilation, um, having the, the the mask in case if they have any uh, you know the pre-existing health condition, so that can make a huge difference uh, to them. But also then looking into uh, you know the, uh, the some of the issues um, as uh, you know the Angus was mentioning that if you have the volume, then I guess the, if they know that you know it will go on linger for longer time, then they might be more receptive of these ideas. Okay, um, I've got a question from uh, Barton Tinache. So if you want me to mention your company name, you could uh, I mean the country name, so you could also uh, uh, you know mention your country. I can I'm happy to kind of uh, you know introduce you. Uh, they say the global air pollution is the project is still going on. If yes, do you intend to add more African countries? Um, uh, yes, uh, the project is uh, uh, going on. Uh, we are trying basically to secure uh, more support actually to expand it. And we are keen to add more African countries in, in future. Um, although there are uncertainties in terms of what we'll be doing, but we have a very defined set of activities which we want you to carry forward. For example, one of the things we wanted to do is uh, looking into the um, uh, into the mass, uh, sorry, the uh, the guidance document. Uh, but the another thing is also expanding actually these studies into different domains, uh, like schools. So we are still looking for the opportunities. But I would suggest that you might want to drop me an email so that we can keep you. I can keep you in in our uh, you know the list and keep you updated when the opportunities arises and we can you know bring you on board. Um, we got another question from Professor Maria de Fatima Andreid from Brazil. So she's asking Professor Ongas, thank you for presenting the results. Is it possible to use the system with the air conditioning system in buildings and the use in hospitals? Can the filtration system could avoid exposure, exposition for virus and bacteria? Yeah, great. Thanks for the, the question, Maria. Um, so the system was developed with the with, uh, with air conditioning systems in mind for, for commercial industrial buildings as a starting point. So yes, is the answer to the first part of your question. Um, what we have developed so far is, is, is actually relatively small air handling unit. So for a hospital, we generally have a much larger, and, and so we have a bit of work to do to, to, to scale it up. But yes, it could be applied to hospitals. But um, could it avoid uh, viruses and bacteria? I mean, the, the system essentially um, does not replace filters. The filters in, 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 in the HVAC system are still required. It, it essentially extends their life, reduces the rate at which they are loaded with particles. And so that saves energy and also then re reduces concentrations going in. So you would still require the HEPA filter for the viruses and bacteria. Um, uh, it wouldn't necessarily make those better. It generally works for heavier particles and the viruses are a bit smaller. Thank you, thank you, Angus. Um, we got uh, um, another question uh, from uh, Dr. Adedeji uh, from Nigeria. 
Thank you, Professor Mackes and Mackeng Nabola for your presentation. Do you think electrostatics or wet scrubbing can be used for de-dusting de 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 clogged filters to avoid back pressure issue? I'm thinking about these ideas for engineering mosquito nets for use in Africa to ensure improved natural ventilation while keeping mosquitoes and dust out. Yeah, that's a very interesting question as well. Thanks for that. So, so we've certainly thought about adding electrostatic an electrostatic uh, capability to our design, and it, it certainly would improve it. Um, and the electro addition of an electrostatic charge won't consume a very large amount of energy, so you know it could be reasonably sustainable. For the application you're thinking of with, with mosquito nets, I think that could work, and I, I'm aware that there are similar sort of. Um, systems that don't involve filters you know within sort of large factory halls that are just using a kind of electrostatic effect to capture particles um with with wet scrubbing that could be harder to do because obviously then you need a system to to um to uh, pump the fluid around and and capture the fluid and treat it after it's so i'm not, I'm not sure how, how that would work with a mosquito net it'd be more complicated it seems on the face of it electrostatics would be easier to achieve to begin with yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, the idea of, uh, um, you know, the nets, especially if you are recommending, uh, you know, to keep the windows or doors open, if the uh, you know, external environments allow us to do so, um, then I guess this might be helpful uh, in terms of, uh, um, because there is a lot of problem of the mosquitoes, as you rightly mentioned, so that can at least, you know, that gets the, the fresh air intake rather than the, um, you know, the with the, with the mosquitoes. And I believe that this practice is quite common in many developing countries. Uh, you, may, you might see actually, um, you know, um, that there are like these uh, uh, wire masses, which is like a fine, very fine grained. They are kind of a fixture of any windows, uh, you know, are being put uh, in houses in many countries. Mm. So it does basically have automatic, but uh, um, in, in places where you know those windows are not designed that meticulously, I believe that that will help actually some sort of a you know the the, the wire mess. And I agree with the wet scrubbing issue, which will be more challenging because you might need a mechanical system there to operate it. Mm, yeah. And also the maintenance and then the um, you know the consumption of energy and so on will become yeah. other issues. You think you think about it actually the, the 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 common mesh that's on on windows and doors could be easily electrified. Actually, I, I was thinking of more of a of a textile yeah. mesh. On, on a bed, but yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, um, I've got another question coming from Dr. Hamid Omid Warbona. So he's uh, from the GKR at University of Surrey. Professor Prasant, what is the plan to maintain your collaboration with external partners in the in 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 this network in future? Um, that's a very good question. The 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 resources are always the you know the challenging part of these collaborations, uh, but we have been. Uh, you know, maintaining uh, this over the last uh, many years now, and we got a very good working relationship as well as the understanding among partners. So we have some activities uh, which will continue and that will allow us to, uh, you know, uh, the, the interactions. But at the same time, we are also working on, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities, uh, you know, if you can get actually to, to, to have this formal, uh, you know, the collaborations going on. Uh, but I just also need to mention a thing that uh, you know I've been we have been also working um, on the the national or international kind of you know the research bits actually which uh, um, allows another mechanism for the engagement. So for example, the recent uh, the reclaim network uh, you know that we had uh, the funding for. So we had um, the number of partners already involved in there. The others are signing it up. Uh, although there, there may not be that kind of, uh, you know, the direct kind of interaction there, but what we are also looking for is if there are any specific calls with those countries, so we can, you know, um, we can join with those partners and then try to put actually those joint bits. But I guess the, the point is valid. So for now, I think we will, we are uh, actively looking for opportunities to kind of, you know, to extend this network uh, in future, because that's a valuable thing which has happened as part of this collaboration over the, you know, the many years. And that has been helping everyone, uh, you know, in um, uh, not only the uh, from the research perspective, but also giving the exposure to a lot of, uh, you know, the young researchers, like the MSc students, PhDs, postdocs in different groups. 
And uh, I can see that, uh, you know, when they were working on the papers, so there is a, a the group of people that have been interacting with each other, they've been talking with each other. So there are a lot of these kind of, uh, you know, the hidden benefits, which we don't see, uh, you know, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the outputs, but they are really asset actually, you know, to this uh, collaboration uh, and to the people who have been involved in there. Um, I think we have reached to the 10 o'clock, so we should really be closing it. So there were only two questions here. The one is uh, Bertrand, he sent his email, um, sorry, Bertrand, um, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name well, but if you can drop me an email, that would be a very good way of keeping, um, you know, keeping the email in the in inbox, uh, but we will, I'll keep, you know, we'll keep these notes um, in terms of your email address. I don't think we have any, any further questions here. So, and we are reached to the end of the time as well. So I would like to, uh, you know, thank uh, Alex for sharing, uh, you know, this session so well and, uh, and, uh, and manage and give actually us uh, a quite plenty of time to answer these questions. So thank you very much for your, you know, the brilliant leadership to these sessions and uh, your time. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, you took this request at the very last minute. So, so, so very thankful for your efforts. I would like to thank our uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Ongas Maknabola, for his time and fascinating presentation. So it's a very interesting work. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that could uh, um, trigger more discussions among, among colleagues and partners in there. I think um, we really don't see actually our, um, you know, um, uh, the event team. Uh, we had Anna and Hedy. I'm not sure whether you can uh, you know, turn on your cameras and show your faces, but you have been fantastic uh, to help us, uh, you know, run these webinars. Uh, and it has been done so professionally and so nicely that uh, you know it was uh, um, it was it was amazing actually. So I would like to thank on behalf of our, all of our team uh, for this, uh, uh, you know, for all your support actually you have provided over the last seven webinars. So thank you very much for that. Last but not the least, uh, uh, you know, the, the GK team members that have been, um, Sarkawat has been since the beginning, then Rana has been a very instrumental in organizing a lot of these, uh, you know, these, these webinars, especially in, in Cairo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, working throughout these projects as well. And some of the new members like Huevin, so she's based in China, she has been, um, you know, uh, one of our PhD students, um, very effectively, you know, uh, providing support. Um, we have been having uh, the new, you know, the partners from Nigeria I did, and they have been, uh, you know, doing uh, some fantastic work. But obviously, all these, uh, um, you know, the, the PIs from different cities who have done a fascinating job in the last, you know, uh, the, 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 since we started this collaboration, and they have gone above and beyond whenever something was needed, because <clears throat> there was not a lot of money available, but what we have produced is, you know, is, is, Kind of amazing and then kind of an exemplary so i would like to thank all of you i may not be able to uh, name each and everyone but you can feel that uh, where i'm coming from and i really feel uh, sad in a way that this is our last kind of a, you know the webinar but uh, um i i wish that we will have an opportunity uh to secure more resources and continue uh with a uh, you know with this with this journey together and with a aim actually of bringing cleaner to all uh, you know, collaboratively and globally. So thank you very much, everyone.